Thank you. It's great to be here. So I am Sal Khan. I'm the, the CEO of the not-for-profit Khan Academy, and I'm here at the Commonwealth Club of California to interview John Doerr, author of Measure What Matters, How Google, Bono, and the Gates Foundation Rock the World with OKRs. So, John, my first question is, you are John Doerr, famed venture capitalist, uh, early investor in Google, Amazon, Twitter. I could imagine many things that you would write books about. Uh, innovation, team building. What are OKRs and why is this your focus? So, uh, OKRs are a deceptively simple but truly powerful system to allow people, I love people, to do amazing things. Most of the amazing things in the world are done by teams. And so OKRs uh, possess five real superpowers. They allow teams to focus, to get really aligned, to be committed like never before to audacious goals, to track those goals, and then to stretch, to do things that are almost impossible. Focus, align, commit, track, stretch. You know that's just the facts about what this system can do. And so. I can tell you a story. I was exposed to these a, a long time ago, impressed by them, and, and, and so I made it, uh, they were given to me, in fact. I wanted to take this gift and share it with lots of others. So for two or three decades now, wherever I can, I've been like Johnny Lo Loman, Willie Loman, the Johnny Appleseed of OKRs, taking this system to large companies, small companies, nonprofits, um, and, uh, I always felt that I'd only scratch the surface with a 90-minute slideshow or talks and, and that it might deserve more than that. And what's your, you know, I think for people who are new to OKRs, people listening at home, they'll say, well, this sounds like goal setting. Are OKRs goals? And if they are or are not, how are they, they, they different? Well, it is goal setting, to be sure, um, and more. And I think, I think the best way to define them would, would be for me to just tell you what they are. Could we do that first? Yes. Yeah, great. So objectives and key results is not a silver bullet or silver buckshot. It's, it's not a magical kind of potion. It's simply a tool. And uh, it, it's abbreviated OKRs. And, and uh, that stands for objectives, which is what you want to have accomplished and key results, which is how we're gonna get it done. Now what makes for good OKRs and bad OKRs? Really good OKRs are significant. They're concrete. They're action-oriented, and uh, they're, they're frankly inspirational. They're kind of long-lived. This is what I want to have accomplished. Key results, in contrast, are very specific and time-bound they're aggressive but realistic, and above all else, they're measurable and verifiable. Uh, one of the students of OKRs, Marissa Mayer, is fond of saying, if it doesn't have a number, it's not a key result. So to repeat, objectives, key results, what and how. But I think it's the origins of this system that, that really uh, conveys more of the power to it. And it, as I mentioned, was a gift that uh, was given to me right after I came to Silicon Valley. I came to Silicon Valley as a, a long-haired electrical engineer who had a lot to learn, uh, wanted to someday start a computer company. My dad was an entrepreneur. And so I, I called up all the venture capitalists I could, figuring they knew something about starting companies, trying to get an internship. Guess what? All of them turned me down. <laughs> but one of them said, we just invested in this little chip company in Santa Clara by the name of Intel. Why don't you see if you can get a job from them? So I cold called the highest ranking official I could there. His name was Bill Davidow. And at the end of the day, I talked my way into a job writing benchmarks for Intel microprocessors. There were some pretty amazing things about that summer for me. Uh, the, the, the first is that I'd come to Silicon Valley with no job, no place to live, and no girlfriend. My girlfriend had dumped me. <laughs> It, it was worse than that. She, she and was. She's in, in the room today. She's in the room. Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> and you know her, which is I do. even more awkward. Yes. We may return to that subject. <laughs> but here's the deal. Uh, I was pretty uh, 
annoying and persistent and all that. And uh, I applied for this job. I got the job. It was pretty amazing. The company had made a spectacular invention. And guess whose office was down the hall from mine? Ann Dorr, his girlfriend who was trying to avoid me. So she was not at all amused when I... Ann Howland at the time. Ann Howland at the time. You're right. Ann Howland at the time. We've been married 40 years. And... Uh, the other amazing thing about the company, not nearly as amazing, I'll hasten to add, was it was led by a Hungarian emigre by the name of Andreas Groff, Andy Grove, who's widely regarded as the best manager of his or maybe any other era. He was an educator, fundamentally. And I'll never forget that summer. He said to me something, John, it almost doesn't matter what you know. What matters is what you do. And so ideas are easy. It's execution that's everything. And if you think about it, he was running a semiconductor company where tens of thousands of people have got to get lines a millionth of a meter, a micron wide, exactly right, or nothing works at all. It requires really extraordinary discipline and alignment and focus and commitment. And so Andy Grove invented this system, OKRs. And I got to learn about it uh, that summer. And so I'm going to share with you right now a very short and classic video clip which is 15 seconds of Andy Grove teaching us about OKRs in the Intel University. Let's see if we can do that. The two key phrases of the management by objective systems are the objectives and the key result. And they match the two purposes. The objective is the direction. The key result has to be measured, but at the end you can look without any arguments, say, did I do that or did I not do it? Yes, no. Simple. That's Andy. <laughs> did I do that? Did I not do that? Undisputable. Yes, no. Simple. <laughs> and um, it allowed him, as I say in this book, to frankly save the company when it missed the transition to 16-bit microprocessors. He was able to get thousands of people to turn on a dime and reprioritize and reorganize everything they were trying to do. And when, when did the light bulb go off in your head uh, that this was something unique, something special? Because this was one of your first jobs. It was my, my first. So to some degree, you didn't have the perspective. I did, that I didn't. unusual. Well, I left Intel in 1980 because I had gotten a phone call from a venture capital firm, and I, I, I found one that would commit to back me building a new company if I took their job. And so I said, Andy, I'm going to go do this thing. He said, you're crazy. <laughs> and he, he had the ability to reach inside your chest, pull out your heart, and hold it in front of you while he was saying, Dor, you don't want to be a venture capitalist. I mean, that's like being a real estate salesperson. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. <laughs> Except in his eyes. <laughs> and uh, instead he said, come run the Intel microprocessor software division, which didn't exist in shouldn't have probably. And, and so I, I went ahead and joined Kleiner Perkins. Um, and I took that lessons, those lessons, to every organization that I tried to work, work with. And just so everyone's on the same page, because I remember even in the early days of Khan Academy, you being the apostle for OKRs, and frankly, I as a young entrepreneur, not really getting it, mm. not getting un until we were larger and realizing how hard it is to align a team towards a common objective. Yes. And so one thing that's important to emphasize, because goals are used for a lot of things. Sometimes they're used for alignment. Sometimes they're used for uh, performance management. Yeah. It's, a, it's a key point in the book that OKRs are more for align, and correct me if I'm wrong, more for alignment, but you don't, if someone doesn't hit their OKR, it doesn't mean they have a lower bonus. Yes, exactly right. In fact, you want to divorce bonuses and compensation from these kinds of goals. And I've got a great story to share with you about that, which was uh, one of the places that I introduced OKRs. And, and, and how they took to it. And uh, probably no organization has adopted OKRs and embraced them more fully than Google. And so in 1989, Larry and Sergey were both 24 years old. This is them in the garage. 98, 98. 98, yeah, thank you yeah. very much. Uh, and I gave them the OKR pitch, like I did everywhere. And at the end of it, I asked them, so guys, what do you think? And I'd like to report to you that they enthusiastically responded, yes, John, we're going to go do this. But the truth of the matter is, uh, Larry had nothing to say at all, and Sergey 
said, well, we don't have any better way to manage the company, so why don't we give this one a try, which I took as a ringing endorsement. Yes. And here's what's happened. Every quarter since then, every Googler has written down her objectives and her key results, posted them on an internal website for everyone to see, and graded them every quarter, done or not done, 0 0.7, 1.0, 0. And then they've tossed them aside because they're not used for bonuses, they're not used for promotions, they're used for a higher calling, which is to get everybody collectively aligned around the few things that, that really matter. So one, one question that falls out of that is, well then how do you do performance management? Is we're aligned, but if you got 70% of your OKR or your key result hit, and someone else got 80%, does that not matter? And does that not influence? Well, the, well, the grades, grades certainly matter, and bonuses or incentives matter, but uh, it's the intrinsic motivation that comes from having selected your own goals and entering into a kind of public social contract with your coworkers that inspires the best performance. Let's say I have an objective to be healthy, and, and then someone, t my doctor, tells me I should run a marathon. Well, I'm way less likely to succeed on that path than if I chose to try to run the marathon and declare to my fellow workers that that's how I was going to achieve my health objective. I, I think the at, at the heart of this system is the notion that there's lots of right answers in any business or advocacy setting. And so if you agree on what the objectives are and let the contributor own the key results, they're going to be more motivated, more successful, and probably more right about how to get the job done. And this, to, I'll, I'll keep doing this because I think it's, it's really sets in when people, when it becomes concrete. Even in your, your health example, the objective would be improve my health, and then the key result that you would set might be, I want to be able to run this far and this long. Exactly. Right. That's very that, measurable. That's the way it goes. And, and by the way, this, this goal system, just the idea throughout corporate America that everybody in an organization would write down and share their goals, that's a pretty radical idea. And then that they grade them publicly for everyone to see, and then not use them for bonuses or promotions. The prevailing goal system before OKRs was something called MBOs, which Peter Drucker invented. And uh, page 27 of the book, <laughs> MBOs are only answer the question what I want to get done, not how. They're annual, they're private, they're siloed, they're top down, they're tied to compensation, they're risk averse. Almost every part of these is wrong, which prompts me to say, uh, many of us are setting goals the wrong way, and most of us aren't setting goals at all. And so Andy Grove comes along and he says, I'm gonna do what and how, and they're gonna be quarterly or monthly, not annual. And they're gonna be public, they'll be transparent. Over half of them are gonna come bottoms up from the team of the organization. And I'm mostly not gonna use these for compensation. And I'm gonna make them aggressive and aspirational, because I want a culture inside Google or Intel or Khan Academy where it's okay to fail, where people can take reasonable, smart risks. Larry Page would say, I'd rather have a team shoot for Mars and know that if they miss, they'll still get to the moon than be really conservative and not try to do something almost audacious. And so I understand the part about alignment, but if OKRs aren't going to be used for um, performance right. measurement uh, or, or accountability in terms of bonuses. Tracking. Tracking. A big part of this book is the importance of reflecting on your OKRs and, and what you call scoring the OKRs. Right. So what, is the, what, is the, what does that do? So first of all, I want to I, I clarify something with a really specific example. A lot of organizations come to me and say, John, it's a really important goal for my sales team to make their quota, their numbers, and I want to pay them commissions on it. Does that mean they can't be part of the OKRs? The answer is, of course, it doesn't mean that. This is simply a tool. And it always can and should be trumped by good judgment. Um, so commonly, people have commissions and quotas, or they have funds they're supposed to raise for their nonprofit. But there's other important things for them to do that are not captured in, in that bonus. Uh, cultivate new marketplaces, open up new verticals, develop an ecosystem. All those things can and should be measured. And they're part of what you'd ask an outbound organization outbound team to do for your organization. 
And what does that do when, even the aspirational ones, where no one would expect you to get 100% of your, those key results, you know, you might get to 40% or 60%. What does the process of looking back at them and, and scoring them do for the organization? Uh, if they're just scored, it does a little. If they're scored in a reflective way that says, hmm, I, I got 90% of my new account quota for this last period of time. But if I really look back on those nine accounts, my goal was 10, actually five of them were crap. And it would have been better if I just focused on three that made a difference. And that'll cause me to make goals better the next time. Hmm. And I, I don't have to grade them just based on how they're measured. Uh, and do you think that this is, you know, there's people in the audience, people at home who, who will be managers of organizations. Almost everyone participates in an organization, so it'll be relevant. But there's also kind of a, a little bit of a lingering question. In the book, you describe Andy Grove as a, a walking OKR. Uh, and, and you start chapter two, and we already talked a little bit about Anne, about how you, you, you got dumped, and you're, you come to Silicon Valley, it seems like, without a job, anything, just to kind of go on this search yes. th to find Anne. Yes. I mean, are OKRs applicable to a, a love life? Is, is there a... <laughs> was well, uh, my, my objective... Anne. We'll see Anne. <laughs> the key result was to not be dumped again. <laughs> not be... I don't know how measurable that is, but we'll... We <laughs> it is, actually. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. It is. Well, at any period of time. We're but, but it's looking all, good so far. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it's, well, Look, this, this, this is not a business book. This is a handbook. This is a book with a dozen stories in it of entrepreneurs, of innovators, people in tiny companies, in large companies, in nonprofits, and how it is they achieve amazing things. One of my favorite stories in the book is of Sundar Pichai when he was a product manager at Google. And he took on an objective from the founders, Larry and Sergey, to create the next generation platform for secure, scalable web-based systems. It was 1998, I think, when he took on that goal, maybe 97. In other words, build a better web browser. And at the time, Microsoft's Internet Explorer, 2007, was the de facto browser. How many of you remember that period of time? The Internet was slow. It was very slow. And so they set out to build a much faster, more secure browser. And with that objective, his key result was to sign up 15 million users in the first year. He was very thoughtful about picking that key result against that goal. He could have said, instead of number of users, I want revenues or engagements or click-throughs. And it would have led to entirely different behaviors, entirely different behaviors. And he missed that goal the first year. So the second year, what did he do? He kept it and upped the ante to 50 million users. He got 70%, he got to 35 million, but still was not satisfied. So in the third year, he raised it to 100 million users. In that year, through the combination of better technology, distribution, and a marketing campaign, he got to 115 million users. Kaboom, he blew it away. Why is this important? Not so much because he blew away the goal, which I like, but he stayed against the same set of priorities with the right key results. And I think that's the larger message of this book that uh, evolved as, as, as I wrote the story. What do I mean by that? I think we're at a really critical moment in our businesses, our communities, and our government. I think many of our leaders and too many of our fine institutions are failing us. In some cases, it's because they're bad or unethical. But in too many cases, it's because they've chosen the wrong goals. And they've led us in the wrong direction. What would have happened if Theranos had transparent goals shared across the entire organization? What difference would this have made in benefits or maybe in the problems that Wells Fargo is trying to work their ways through? What what would have happened if agencies in our government had transparent public, they're public agencies. Imagine the city council in your town or the school board agreeing, these are our objectives, here's how we're gonna measure our key results. And, and so I think the skill of choosing the right goals for the right reasons is uh, a kind of muscle we wanna work on as a nation, as a country, as communities.
And it's a good point because on some level, some folks will say, well, this is simple. You have a, a direction, which is the objective, and the key results, how you measure them, and you get it organization-wide. You, you, you make it super transparent. You post it on your cubicle, whatever. Yep. But to your point that you just made, that seems intuitive and, and, and simple, but that isn't happening. Because once that happens, you can figure out what everyone in an organization is. You know, if, if you have a question about the government, what does that person do? Yes. You would then be able to know that. And there's uh, government agencies that are really interested in deploying these. And indeed, OKRs were used in coordinating the government's response to the Ebola crisis. So th this, this is a powerful, powerful system. And one thing that, you know, everyone in the audience and folks listening, you know, this book, the title, Measure What Matters, it's, it's about, nominally about OKRs, and, and it does actually, as someone who has tried to implement and runs an organization that is implementing a, a variation of OKRs, I have to say I found in a, a lot of insights here that were not obvious uh, when, when I was trying to implement it as a, as a manager, but it's also uh, really a biographical book about yourself. No, uh, it's, it's about entrepreneurs. Entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs that in s most cases I've had the privilege it, But it's your on. life. It's some of the most interesting people you've encountered. There's, there's some really good stories in here. I want to tell you two more stories yeah. if I can. Is that yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> so I work with a remarkable entrepreneur by the name of Jeannie Kim, who worked at Google on a big fiasco called uh, their health database. Left there, bootstrapped a company that provides healthcare data for large employers to try to get affordable, high-quality health care for everyone. Uh, while she was struggling to build this company, she got a call one morning, at 3 in the morning, lived over in Oakland. The voice on the other end of the line said, is this Jeannie Kim? She said, who is, who is this calling me? And he, he said, well, uh, this is uh, Barack Obama. <laughs> and she said, no. Come, come on, really. <laughs> he said, yes, this is the President of the United States. And she said, oh, shit. <laughs> what can I do to help you, Mr. President? <laughs> and he was trying to assemble a team of volunteers to rescue, remember that website, healthcare.gov, the signature event for? And so she put her company on hold. She flew back, uh, worked to rescue that website, succeeded. And once you succeed in building a healthcare data system, all the agencies that are trying to do healthcare work want to work with you. And so she learned that there was another project out for bid, which was the nation's first ever database for 70 million Medicaid members. After 50 years of nothing, we were going to have the first database that took feeds from all 50 states, five territories, District of Columbia. And it was a bet your company kind of moment, which she tried to build that out of her tiny team of 15 people. She made the bet. And then had to set off in a mad rush to hire 65 people, implement security, uh, uh, deliver this system on schedule, on budget, and used OKRs to do it and, and, and succeeded in that regard. She, um, she named the company Nuna after the phrase that her uh, younger brother, Dimong, uses for her because Nuna means big sister in Korean, and he's autistic and epileptic. And it uh, inspired her and the whole team to go on and do lots more work in healthcare data. Example of a very small company, six people, who use this system to uh, make a great big difference. I told you there were two stories I wanted to share. Uh, the, the next would be an unlikely user, I think you might agree, of, of OKRs. And uh, that's an Irish rock star, uh, Bono, whose nonprofit won has big audacious goals, like eliminate non-performing third world debt or end mother to child AIDS transmission by 2020. Uh, and he's got an organization of several hundred people that uh, work on this. And I found many uh, nonprofit organizations, including all the nonprofit ventures <laughs> that I've backed, <laughs> are, uh, have, have really big, they get the objectives right but translating those into key results that, that are really action-oriented and measurable and verifiable is an important thing to do to achieve those missions. And you always want to do that in a way that doesn't stifle the creativity or the passion of the people who are so involved. So here's what Bono has to say about this system. Let me do that.
What actions does your passion lead you to do? If the heart doesn't find a perfect rhyme with the head, then your passion means nothing. The OKO framework cultivates the madness, the chemistry contained inside it. It gives us an environment for risk, for trust, for failing is not a fireable offence. And when you have that sort of structure and environment, and the right people, magic is round the corner. I, I just love that. It cultivates the madness, the creativity, the passion in your organization. Helps establish a culture where failing is not a fireable offense. And so when you have this sort of a simple structure and the right people, you just get magic right around the corner. That was shockingly poetic. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's got a future. I <laughs> but I, I am curious just a little bit of the backstory. I, and I didn't tell John. I was at a U2 concert a couple of years ago. And at the end of the whole thing, like Bono's just like, yeah, just like the thing, one person, John Doerr. I was like, John Doerr? I know John Doerr. He knows, he knows Bono. Yeah, dude. <laughs> but how, how did you and, John, and Bono... Uh, and, 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 and how did you become the guy that he thanks at the end of his, at, at the end of his concerts? <laughs> <laughs> um, you want the truth? Or some version of it. <laughs> <laughs> so a friend of mine, Roger McNamee, was on working with Bono on this nonprofit. And he said, John, would you spend a few minutes with my friend? I'm very concerned that one of his business ideas is going to fail. And that was to create something called RED. And he was uh, going to launch a red American Express credit card in London. And uh, Roger's view was we ought to stop this thing because it could badly affect his, his brand. And so he said, I want you to meet him. I didn't know who you two was. I didn't know Bono. He came by with this short, devout Roman Catholic rocker with a ring in his ear. And you really did not know? No. What year was this? <laughs> this guy. I don't remember. It was like 2000 <laughs> something, right? It was 2000 something. Okay. I'd been I don't know. You're I'd been working with Larry and uh, Sergey. Yeah, no. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, yes. So you didn't embarrassing. know. Embarrassing. Yeah. That's all right. The truth of the matter. Yeah. We went through the plan. It looked to me to be pretty reasonable, but even more important, he was going to announce it in 2 weeks. There's not a chance to do something other than this. And so uh, Bono asked me to work with him and his team on these OKRs and we really hit it off. And he, you know, I think folks who are into management and how do businesses get aligned, they, they naturally will grab. But you don't imagine a rock star, you know, he's a poet, he's a performer, but he immediately he, he, got it. He, he, he got it, and he's joined the movement. And I want to invite everybody in this audience, whether you're in the room or beyond the room, to uh, join this movement. Um, Use this in your organization or your family or your nonprofit. And as you gain experience with it, as you develop your goal muscle, share it with others. Advocate it. Because uh, I think there's very few problems that we have that can't be solved by better leaders and better teams and having uh, the right goals for the right reasons. Have you ever seen uh, OKRs be misused or used in a way that Maybe yes. they're counterproductive? Sure. You, you, can, you can pick the wrong objectives or the wrong measures. And you can do so accidentally, you know, without it intending uh, to, to do that. Uh, it's really important to understand not only where we're trying to go, the what and the how, but also the why. I tend to think of OKRs as empty vessels. This is a, you know, these are powerful sets of containers. But we want to pour into those is our values and our mission. And so the values and mission statements of organizations are easily as important as what these goals are. And uh, the book talks about that. It talks about OKRs, the companion to OKRs, which are called CFRs. What does that stand for? That stands for Conversations, Feedback, and Recognition, CFRs. And the best way to think about that is a football game. In OKRs, the goal line is the objective. And the 10-yard markers are the key results. It's how we measure our, our progress. But that's not everything that's going on to win the game. There's all these plays we've got to run. We've got to huddle. We've got to call things in real time, make substitutions. And those are the kinds of conversations and feedback that we want to make to have a, a winning team really excel. 
So more and more organizations, there's a whole chapter in here out of, out of, about Adobe, are dumping. They're literally ditching annual performance reviews, which are typically written at the end of the year. You dredge through emails to try to develop information. By the time it's out of date, you deliver this backward-looking review. And guess what happens? Good people quit. <laughs> there's almost no good that comes from that. So more and more organizations are saying, I want to deliver more frequent feedback in nearly real time because it's going to make my team better. And it's really important for millennials. What do we know about the millennials? They want constant feedback. They want to know how their work figures into the big picture. They don't want to be micromanaged. They want to run their own goals. They want to set their own goals. And so you can tell this system is really working when 60% of the goals come bottoms up. They're not delivered top down. And uh, I, I knew there was something magical about a particular version of the system called BetterWorks, which has mobile OKR goal setting with social signals and nudges. When I was uh, in the checkout line at Whole Foods and I saw a millennial worker from Intuit Company checking off her goals, mm as they, they were getting dinner for the, for the evening. That when this is working, it becomes... So just be clear, this person was using OKRs for their dinner. No, no. no. Oh, no, okay, 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 okay. Oh, no, no, okay, I understand. They're, they're, they're into it OKRs. They were checking them out where they're checking, you know. No, I thought that would have been cool too, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. That would have been great. Yeah. Um, God, I've lost that train. Sorry, so, no, you, you were very happy to see a millennial in the line at Whole Foods. It gave you, you sign. Using the system, yeah. because... Some of the largest organizations, one of the largest employers in the country uses these things. I mean, you can't do it on when you're at any kind of scale on PowerPoint and Google Docs. You, know, you, you want a tool that has social nudges so that you can cheer people on or, or kick them to, to go forward. So the pitfalls are, obviously, if you have bad objectives, that's not going to turn out well. Right. Um, if you have bad unethical leaders, that's a problem. That's too. not going to work out well. If you use it maybe as more of a stick versus... Um, other forms of feedback, you know, more right. continuous that conversations right. and all of that. Yeah. That's another pitfall. Any others that kind of pop up your mind where you've seen it? Yeah, the, the, bi the biggest single failure is if the leader of the organization is not personally committed. Mm. And so next week, Sundar Pichai, now the CEO of Google, will stand up in front of 70,000 Googlers via video or in the room. And he will personally review his objectives and key results for the last quarter. What he got done, not done, he'll grade them all. And he's the CEO, he'll review them for the company. Sometimes leaders want to hide behind the company's goals being theirs. Wrong message. You want to be personally accountable. And then, so will everyone else in the organization. Interesting thing. These are on a public internal website. They've never leaked. This is the game plan for Google. It's never leaked. Because the googly culture says... We want to be, have transparency inside. It's a pretty loud and noisy place, as you can tell from reading the press. But um, having that sense of alignment, commitment, transparency, uh, prioritization is powerful stuff. Now, uh, as I said, it's not a silver bullet. But when you have a strong culture and strong management and you embrace this system, it can take you to the mountaintop. I've seen it happen. And one of the things that's really neat about this book, because you know, people, there's, there's books about business or management that'll be in the abstract. But one of the things that I think is really fun is almost every chapter, you, you literally have emails that people sent within the company, uh, you know, all the way back to Intel, but even Google, where you know, managers kind of shaming other, in a good way, managers who haven't done their OKRs yet, because to your point, they have to be bought in, yes. uh, which is, I think, uh, it makes it very, very tangible. I, I'm almost curious, how did, how did you get these emails? Were, are these things you saved? Did you kind of just ask people around? Once, once I, so, so I started on my first version of the book that I would charitably describe as OKRs for dummies. It was very prescriptive and it was a disaster. So I junked that version of it and said, instead, let's try to get clear on what the benefits are and then just tell stories. Because I'm an engineer. I have to fight with words. It's really hard for me to write or write a book. I'm not gifted and eloquent the way you and Many of the other people here are. I'm also are. an engineer. Anyway, you, you're an engineer also. <laughs> but, but hey, here's the deal. I only had to write a third of this book. Two-thirds of it is in the voices of Sundar Pichai or Susan Wojcicki or, or uh, Jeannie Kim. The book's dedicated to two of my mentors. One is Andy Grove, and there's a lot about him in this book. But the other is uh, an extraordinary leader by the name of Coach Bill Campbell, 
And I think the dedication to him starting on page 247 is one of my favorite parts of the book. There's great resources in the back of it, S some really wonderful uh, prescriptions from Google about how they use it and, and many others. But I've, I've, been, uh, I've been pleasantly surprised by the number of people who write and say, hey, this is really useful. My, my only aim was to, to do something that was useful. And so I, I made a website called whatmatters.com and there's more stories there. In fact, there's a very powerful story of the Khan Lab School at Khan Academy using OKRs with their sixth graders. So imagine this. You're a sixth grader and you've got a lesson plan to learn this about algebra and this about math and so forth, and you've got tests and all that coming up. But at the start of every semester and every year, every Khan Lab student writes down her ob learning objectives and key results for the year, shares it with the teachers, shares it with their parents, and then tracks their progress month by month, quarter by quarter. Can you imagine what it would mean if we did that in all of our crummy urban schools in the country? You know, if, 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 if we had that level of transparency and engagement. Uh, can you imagine what would happen if we used this in our hospital systems? I think. The only thing as hard as running a semiconductor company is trying to get 50,000 people in a national hospital chain and to, to do the right thing. They make tens of thousands of decisions each all the time. So I ta in fact, this morning I was talking to a collection of hospital CEOs in Salt Lake City. I said, I can't imagine you guys would use this, right? There is no room for failure. You must achieve 100 people. They said no. They said, we've got certain goals that must be achieved, so-called committed goals. But there's other stretch goals to improve the member experience. We want to measure it. So there's two large national hospital systems now whose CEOs have declared the most important thing they're going to do in 2019 and, and is deploy these OKRs. Uh, let's do uh, well, I'll finish the thought, but I also but want that's, to That's the movement. You should join this movement. I, I'm you on the movement. <laughs> yes. I'm no, but I think you should do, s as only you can, some con stories oh. that illustrate the fundamental principles of this. Absolutely. And you no. have what, 10 million unique visitors a month? We have, we have, yes, we have our share. <laughs> <laughs> the, no, and, and, and thanks for the shout out to KLS. I have to say, uh, if anything else, there's nothing cuter than seeing a seven-year-old reflect on his or her goals, uh, objectives, and key results. And it's great life training as well. Yeah? Yeah. No, no, absolutely. I, people, but, people, people use these in their families, you know. They, they use them for, uh, and you can have hidden personal goals that you don't share through the whole organization. I, I do want to do a, a double click on something you just mentioned, which was the, the committed versus aspirational goals. Because when I read that, I was like, oh, that's how you connect the stuff you have to do with shooting for Mars. Right. So actually, just explain that a little bit more. Because I think there's a lot of sure. people who are still like, yeah, but there's some things we just have to do. Our, our customers expect us to do that. If we can't just do 70% of that. I'm really glad you asked that. And that's exactly the way it works. I don't, I don't know what to add to the explanation other than a good starting point is to decide at this moment in time how much risk-taking do you want in your culture? And there may be certain times, maybe you're getting ready for another financing, where you don't want to take a lot of risk. You've got to get these few things done. And then at another time, you may have a more secure position in your, in your marketplace, your advocacy agenda, where you want to stretch. But the, uh, the Google team, usually there's a simple grading system. Things are done or not done or half done. Of course, the Google engineers reduced this to decimal points of accuracy. And then they said, we're going to have goals that are committed, where you must achieve 100%. And then after that, we'll be prepared to have also aspirational goals. And so they uh, grade them that way. And, and John, you're just a, a meta question. You're a venture capitalist. And I think a lot of people listening in, in the audience today will say, well, you know, John's an operator at heart. How? how is this typical of, of the venture capital industry? I think the stereotype is, oh, you know, read business plans, you know, do some deals, put, allocate money. But you're clearly much more involved as, I mean, you're, you're every, every team that you've worked with, some of these story teams, Google, Amazon, Twitter, you are, you are the spreading the message of how do you do alignment and, and reflection. Is this what a lot of VCs do? Uh, I think there's, there's VCs that add particularly those who have operating experience who've started or built companies. I'm thinking of like Reed Hoffman, mm -hmm. uh, M Mike Moritz. I don't think he started a company, but he's a great team coach and team builder. So I think 
I believe venture yeah. capital is a service organization, fundamentally. It's not, it's not a money management organization. The issues aren't really money. You, you can only lose one times your money in venture capital, so <laughs> you really want to be focused on how you can help a team. Whether it's a team in a nonprofit, whether it's a social entrepreneur, an education entrepreneur, how, how can we make teams more effective? What kind of world would it be if, if we could do that? That's why you should join this movement. That's why you should go to whatmatters.com, hear some more of these stories, tell your own, sign up for, sign up for the campaign. What, what's your sense, just thinking kind of bigger picture, we're, we're talking about how almost everyone could use this in some way, shape, or form. Where do you think is, and you maybe touched on a few, is it government and healthcare where we could see the biggest gains, or is there other places where you, in some ways the world would be different if people were more transparent and uh, environment I'm hearing from the audience? What, what, what are your thoughts there? Um, I think any human endeavor, any, any cause can be, any team can be amplified, uh, made more effective, made uh, willing to take bigger risks. We, we, we've, uh, this is not a time for us to lean back. We should lean forward. And, and, and clearly I believe that this can change and shape the culture of large organizations as well as set it in a powerful way for smaller ones, startups. Yeah. I'll, I'll take some questions from the audience. I have two right here, and anyone else who has questions, feel free to uh, get, get them up here. Can, can I just say one yeah. more thing about this? This system isn't easy. It's deceptively simple, but it requires work to do this well, and so if you're going to do it, you should commit to try it, I believe, for at least a year or so. But you'll get better. You'll build goal muscle, and at the end of it, when people are doing this well, it's actually fun to do. Yeah. And actually, before I get a question, you mentioned Bill Campbell, and this is a fascinating figure because I think a lot of folks outside of Silicon Valley may or may not have heard his name, but inside, he is a legend. And almost every CEO management team in, Sil in Silicon Valley quotes him and, and says, what, would, what did he do that was so unique and, and special for, coach, for so many people? The, the coach. Uh, he had uh, an amazing ability to make to coach teams, not just individuals, and have the team members all believe that he had their back. He's earthy, he was profane, he could take people out to the woodshed, but everyone understood that he was always there for the success of the team. Uh, I, I recruited him out of Apple and worked with him on, on multiple companies. He, uh, when Steve Jobs returned to Apple, Remember, he got the resignation of everyone on his board of directors to voluntarily resign. This is the largest non-hostile takeover ever of a public company. And uh, the first director that he added back to his board was Bill Campbell. I asked Bill to come coach Eric Schmidt at Google, and Eric, a successful and rightly proud man, felt insulted by the suggestion. Uh, a year later, he said it was the best decision he made to, to get Bill in, and so for years, Bill was on the Apple board and attending the weekly staff meetings at Google, which made Steve pretty uncomfortable. And <laughs> he wanted him to stop working with Google. And Bill said, don't push me to do this. You know, you, we might not like the answer that I come up with. And he said, besides, I don't know anything about technology. I'm just, I'm not helping these guys with tech. I can't even spell HTML, you know. <laughs> I'm here just to help businesses be better every day. So I have a, a question here. It says, uh, reading various publications about uh, Jeff Bezos, and you're famously an early investor and, and know Jeff, uh, and the meteoric rise of Amazon, uh, is it, it appears that some startups are more about power than profit. Um, is What are your thoughts there? Well, I, I don't think, uh, I, I guess I disagree w with his view of Amazon based on what I know of Jeff and, and, and what their priorities are. Uh, Jeff, for the longest period of time, has been really clear. He wants to make uh, Earth's friendliest store, uh, best store. And his strategy is simply to offer wider selection with better prices, with the best customer experience. And it, uh, there's an important point here. Each of those things, like the prices, the selection, and the customer experience, are inputs, and they're all measurable. You know, Jeff doesn't like setting goals on outputs, like sales or things like that, because you can't really control outputs. You can only control inputs. And so he would say those are the key results that he wants to measure against a larger objective. And uh, it, as he says, I think this is just 
just day one. It's and, and just to kind of make that a little bit more clear is, is that, you know, from the outside, a lot of people could look at a, a Jeff Bezos and, you know, Amazon is growing incredibly into all sorts of industries. And they're like, okay, they might give lip service to, you know, doing this for the customer or whatever else, but surely it's about profits. But you know him and how he operates from the early days. And has this been pretty consistent? That yes. It's always been about the inputs and the always outputs been, just kind of played out? Focus on the inputs. Establish an objective function mm -hmm. for an important input. Never put a team on it that's bigger than you could feed with two pizzas. That's called the two pizza team wow. rule. <laughs> and uh, plant lots of seedlings, be very patient. And uh, I, Amazon, I, I consider Amazon to be an internet treasure. It's one of those things on the internet which if it wasn't there, our lives would be different. We would miss it. Same for Google. Or look, how, how's this for an objective? Let's organize all the world's information and make it freely available on any device for anyone, anywhere, anytime. That's a pretty good objective. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is, okay, so I have this, um, well this, is, this is a good one. So it says, what's John's current OKR? And how do you overcome employees' fear of public failure to promote a culture of audacious goals? Uh, one of my current objectives is to uh, work with the nation's uh, greatest innovators, entrepreneurs, and people in larger institutions to transform healthcare so that it's uh, more affordable, higher quality, and available to everyone. And, how, and the second part, how do you uh, get over employees' fear of public failure and promote culture of taking audacious goals? So uh, I think you should celebrate when you kill a project early a failed project, because that frees the organization team to do something else. They do this at Amazon, they do it at Google with their moonshots, and so it has to do with the culture. Uh, and the next question is also a good one, uh, and it's a topic we've already touched on a little bit. Uh, you briefly mentioned the why in the process. I wanted to ask you what your original why was for moving to Silicon Valley, maybe Anne in parentheses, and how was your why changed since your success and growth in life? Mm. So uh, my why was I wanted to be like my dad. He was my hero. I grew up eldest of five kids in a middle class family in St. Louis, Missouri. He was a mechanical engineer. I studied electrical engineering. Outgoing, enthusiastic guy. Started some companies with some friends. Said to all the door kids, We're, we love you equally. We're going to give you one thing in education. and." Nothing more, no inheritance, no family businesses. And uh, when I wanted to do two things, these are my whys, namely uh, go to California to find Dan and learn about starting computer businesses, he loaned me $50. And I drove out here with that. And Which was probably like $300. <laughs> it was more than. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> So that, that, <coughs> that was my why. I think in the larger sense, look, a lot of organizations have goals. They have sales objectives and shipping product and so forth. And these are relatively soulless collections of numbers. And so what's really important is to connect the purpose and the passion behind goals with uh, those that are the priorities in the moment. And that's when I think you get organizations that truly achieve operating excellence. Yeah. So this is one that's related to, to the answer about your personal OKR, especially in healthcare. Uh, do you have an opinion on what are good or bad OKRs within a healthcare organization, for example, mental health care? Uh, I find healthcare to be hard and humbling. And uh, certainly the homeless problem that we're witnessing and our we're all citizens here are part of creating is inextricably bound up in, in mental health. I, I asked a, a physician, healthcare leader who I admire a lot, what is the right care management protocol to, on a scale of a basis, deal with mental health problems? And uh, he didn't have an answer. I, I think it's a hard problem. It's one we gotta tackle. So if, you, if someone were tackling it, what would be a good objective? Would it be, you know, Actually, I'll, I'll defer to you, but it was have more people be able to have healthy lives, or what, what, what would be a reasonable objective and I, 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 maybe key results there? Um, 
I, th I think the, uh, I think from the little that I know, the, the deepest issue in mental health or is the people that are becoming uh, mentally disabled. And so identifying those people early and dealing with what they call the social determinants of health uh, would, would be one of the key results. I'd want to give a lot more thought to what the objective is. But uh, if we can't measure the key results, uh, then the OKR for dealing with mental health will be good. Tell you what, let's use this as a place where people with keen ideas on this uh, send a note in to whatmatters.com. Yeah. And we can continue the conversation there. That'd be excellent. So this one is, is an interesting one because I think the stage of, of where you are as a venture capitalist, you don't, you aren't, and maybe never really looked at about return. You always looked at impact. Hmm. And you even mentioned that just now. So this question is, how do you decide what goals are simply missing resources and decide it's worth investing in? So I'm, I'm reading that you're looking to solve venture capital as a potential vector to solving big problems in the world. So how, when do you decide that, okay, this is just, they need resources and advice and whatever else versus it's just unsolvable. So, so th my modification of that is it's not venture capital, but it's entrepreneurs mm -hmm. that have the power to solve these amazing problems that are before us. And I think all of us, cert certainly I, uh, divide the world's problems into three buckets, right? There are the problems that are not worth working on. We'll set those aside pretty quickly. And, and then there are the things that matter that you can uniquely make a difference about. And then a lot of other things that matter that you can't. And I think if you can parse the finite time that we all have into those three buckets, then you can go have impact. My, my two passions are uh, healthcare system transformation and climate, climate crisis. I think we're, uh, <laughs> I think we're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think the, the likelihood that we have irreversible catastrophic climate crisis is greater now than it was 10 years ago. Uh, I think we still have time. We have just as much time as we need, but we need leaders and we need action around the world with clearer goals that are measurable. I, I mean, you know, given what you, what you just said, I, if as a, a young right, person at any stage of life, uh, given some of what you just said, you know, maybe the writing's on the wall at least for the next 20 years or something of what might happen to sea levels or, or, or temperature levels. What gives you your, because you're continuing to work on it, so you're clearly not cynical about it. You clearly think that a difference can be made. What, what gives you that hope? Uh, well, <coughs> what gives me the hope is some of the data, some of, some of the progress that we're making. But I think uh, we're making great progress in the electrification of transportation and lower cost generation of energy, lower carbon generation of electricity through solar, pan solar panels, but uh, that's not gonna get us where we need to be. We need to be a zero carbon planet net by 2050. Absolutely zero, and we do not have the technologies today to do that, which is why I'm so excited to see Bill Gates turn not just some of his resources, but his time and his convening power to creating billion dollar breakthrough energy. And we need some technology innovations. Easily as important, is uh, we need regulation, we need standards for uh, efficiency in appliances. The way, here's the story. I mean, what's really gonna matter is the way Asia industrializes. And if they build their new cities the way we've built ours, we're screwed. But uh, China's industrializing at the rate of 10 Manhattans a year. 100 million people moving from rural settings into urban settings. Uh, the choices we make about how those cities are built matter a lot. Does it look like the Chinese are? I think the Chinese in the form of regulations and market phenomena are doing better than we're doing in the US, with the exception of the state of California. Yeah, yep. and what about healthcare? That's another area where people can look at this is just an intractable problem. There's just, it's just complex, the various incentives from the various stakeholders, but you continue to invest in places like Nuna Health with Jeannie Kim. What gives you hope there that, that a debt can be made? So I ha have a theory of change for the healthcare system, and it's simply as follows. If we liberate the healthcare data, which right now is literally incarcerated, every hospital, every insurance company, even a lot of government agencies, they, people with EMR systems all believe this data belongs to them. That's wrong. 
the state is yours and mine as, as citizens, but still the laws allow them to hoard it, to use it. They're not evil people. They're using it for their business advantage. So if we liberate this data and have flexible ways to pay for outcomes, not fee for service, not so that the more x-rays you do, the more money you're going to make. Explain that a little bit more, because it's a term of the trade, fee for fer service versus pay for outcomes. Right. What does that mean? So um, what it means right now is there's a movement underway to what's called value-based care. Um, instead of paying for more imaging or more procedures, I want to pay for someone to have a successful hip replacement or an effective uh, uh, return to a level of cardiac health. And I want to reward the organization that achieves quality and lower costs. Um, do you remember when Google entered the online advertising business? At the time, most ads were television ads. They were sold by people in over three martini lunches on Madison Avenue. Nobody knew which ads worked and which didn't. These two Stanford computer dropouts said, we got another idea. We're going to have people only pay for ads if they click on them. And they'll only th we'll have an auction. It'll be an open auction. Everybody will bid. The winning bidder only pays the second highest price. It's called a modified Queen's auction. And guess what? Last year, there were more online ads sold than television ads because there was transparency. There was a market. There were measures of quality. None of those systems exist today in healthcare. And, y and yet, healthcare in the United States is almost three and a half trillion dollars a year. Online ads in the U.S. are about sixty or seventy billion dollars. <coughs> so healthcare is fifty times bigger. My dream is that some entrepreneurs can bring that kind of transparency, quality, and affordability to our healthcare system. Because, as Warren Buffett says, uh, you people who think you care about taxes and tax rates. Healthcare costs are the tapeworm of the American economy. Those have risen from 2.5% to 18% of our national activity. That can't go on. Yeah. And this next question from the audience is, how do you advise individuals to apply daily practice towards achieving OKRs? Well, uh, it depends on uh, what your objectives are and your personal situation. Maybe a, a, a personal story would be helpful there. I, I had an objective to have a, a healthy family, in the broadest sense of the world, healthy. And what I read is that uh, having family dinners would make a big difference. So Ann and I set a goal that I would be home for dinner 20 nights a month by 6.30 p.m. and be fully present during the dinner. <laughs> so this how you did this? I did this. This was a stretch goal. <laughs> and, I <laughs> and I shared it with my team, and I didn't always achieve it. But <laughs> that was uh, an example of personal OKR. That's, that's excellent. I'm going to do that Are you? Yeah. 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 I, th I think I'm 20 nights a month. I don't think I'm as busy as you, so it's easier to achieve. <laughs> but it's, uh, so this one, I'll ask it. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a fun question, but you know, we're not trying to be political here. I'll, it says, how would you apply OKRs to the Trump administration? <laughs> Answer it however you'd like. To the, yeah, however you'd like. <laughs> I think the president would say my objective is to make America great again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's probably easy. And then w what are the key results that are going to get us there? Yeah, and, and at least, you know, my understanding of the Trump administration it would be Better trade parity, and you know, and then other things that I. A wall. A wall. Yeah. Yes, I don't want to. <laughs> yes. All right. We'll move to the next one. Um, <laughs> can you g please give us examples of how you use OKRs in as, as an investor and to run an, uh, a venture capital business? I just want to return to the Trump administration. Okay. <laughs> no, we're here for you. So, uh, some of the agencies of the Trump Organization are really interested in improving the efficiency of government. And in particular, there's a fearless leader of CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, by the name of Seema Verma, who's quite committed to opening the data, trying to find waste, and using OKRs to uh, achieve that level of transparency and accountability. Seema Verma buys more stuff every year than anybody in the world. She's responsible for a trillion dollars of our nation's expenditures on Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, and other kinds of programs. So we, uh, we want to have a good government, and 
great government officials. So, so just to just to finish up, uh, you know, of all the things that that are happening in your universe, where where is your mind right now? Is it on how do you apply the the tool of OKRs into these areas of climate and and healthcare and in other areas? Uh, what you know, what are you most excited about right now? Well, I'm learning the most <coughs> about the healthcare system. I think I'm. Uh, most concerned about the climate crisis. There's a lot of really good people working on that. I'm trying to do my part. Uh, the uh, frontier where I want to learn more and quickly is uh, around artificial intelligence. My view is there have been three tsunami-like waves of innovation during our lifetimes. The first was around the 1980s, the microprocessor, the personal computer. Microsoft was a huge winner computer on everybody's desk, Apple, and so forth. 13 years later is 1993. Some University of Illinois grad students dropped out. They wrote a browser for the internet. The internet had been around, but the idea you could point on a picture to click to get something, really big idea. And I had the privilege of backing them at Netscape, but that led to Amazon and to Google, and you can't imagine Khan Academy without that. Okay, 13 years later, what happened? 93, 2006. Steve Jobs, I was walking around the neighborhood with him and he pulled out this thing. He almost never showed me a new product. He said, John, this iPhone 1 almost killed our company. I said, why? He said, well, it has five radios in it. We've never before made something with five radios. You know, there's a Bluetooth radio, an Ethernet radio, phone radios and all that. And he said, and besides, I thought that those plastic buttons on the Blackberry were just brain dead. It was a terrible idea. I turned this thing over, Saul, and on the back it said, eight GB, eight gigabytes. I said, Steve, there's eight gigabytes of flash memory in this thing? He said, yeah. I said, what are you gonna do with it? He said, well, that can be 100,000 songs or 1,000 movies. Steve, this is a platform for people to write programs. And Steve said, I am not interested in having third parties pollute my phone <laughs> with their applications. And do you remember the iPhone 1 didn't have an app store? And I really wanted to make a fund to fund entrepreneurs to write these programs. And I said, if you change your mind, call back. And he was nothing if not flexible, because about nine months later he called and said, let's make that iFund. And he launched the App Store, which led to the whole appification of the economy. Now, the same thing that happened when the iFund and the App Store was launched is the cloud came along. So we had two tsunamis. You can't imagine a mobile phone without a cloud or the cloud without it. Okay, 13 years from 2006 brings us to today. And the question is, what's the next big thing, right? What do you think? I think you're leading to artificial intelligence, which I... <laughs> <laughs> Would you agree? I think so, but I, I like you, I'm trying to read up on it myself yeah. to kind of understand. I, I think when both of us, you know, back when I was in college, I even did an internship at the Artificial Intelligence Lab, but it just felt so primitive then. But it seems like... In the early 80s, there were a bunch of artificial intelligence companies started by Stanford PhDs. And you could tell it was an artificial intelligence company if there were at least three Stanford PhDs. <laughs> and no one was in charge. <laughs> and all those failed. What are you doing in artificial? Are you just reading about it now? Or are you, are you going no, out I'm, there making I'm, investments? I'm funding entrepreneurs and innovators. Yeah. How, do you have a, even a, a, a sense of how it might change our life in, uh, over the next 13 years? I think that... Uh, I think that it could profoundly change our lives. I think in a very pedestrian way, it will improve all processes that involve information and a lot of uh, things that involve customer service and consumer experience. But I'm watching very intently the work going on at DeepMind, you know, Demi with that Google operation in London where he hopes to solve the AGI problem or the artificial general intelligence. Their, their thing might become sentient at some point. I, I, he intends it to do that. Yes. And then I think we have to look carefully at the work going on in China and the ethical concerns that are involved in this kind of work because there's different norms around data and privacy in China and there's a commitment that China has to be the world's leader in artificial intelligence. Yeah, I've read a lot that in some ways China is, is kind of, five years ago they, were no, they weren't really on the they radar. They weren't in the game. And then in the, really in the last two years they are in the game. In certain, in, in application. The U.S. is still leading in research yep. by a lot, but in application because of some of what you talked about, China's taken a, a bit of a lead. Yeah. So artificial intelligence. Yes. Any last thoughts for everyone um, on kind of OKRs, 
be part of this. I mean, it, it, it's it, a movement. It applies everywhere. Think, think, of, think of this as a movement. Try it yourself in your personal life or with a team you care about. Be sure that you get the leader of the team committed to doing it. And, and, and don't give up early. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank, thank you, John. Thank you for everyone for coming. Once again, I'm Sal Khan from the Khan Academy. I'm here with John Doerr, famed venture capitalist, chairman of Kleiner Perkins, author of Measure What Matters, How Google, Bono, and the Gates Foundation Rocked the World with OKRs. And we're here at the California Club of, uh, the Commonwealth Club of California. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.